Welcome to the Swine Health Black Belt Podcast, the latest swine health research digested for you. My name is Dr. Clayton Johnson, your host for today's episode. And joining me on today's episode are Drs. Giovanni Trevisan and Dr. Daniel Linares from Iowa State University. Giovanni and Daniel, thank you guys for coming on the podcast here today. Um, Giovanni, would you mind starting by giving the audience a brief introduction about yourself? Hi, thank you for the opportunity to be here today. And I am a research assistant professor here at Iowa State University. Very good. Thank you, Giovanni. And Daniel, I know many folks in the swine industry are familiar with you and your work, but just in case somebody hasn't met you out there, would you mind introducing yourself? Hi, Clayton. Thanks for having us here. We're excited to be here. My name is Daniel, like you said, and uh, I'm the Roy Scholes Professor of Swine Medicine here at Iowa State University. Happy to be here talking with you today. Very good. Uh, gentlemen, we have a very timely topic. We're going to talk about PERS diagnostics and in particular, uh, whole genome sequencing versus OR5 sequencing. Um, certainly the industry has uh, had a lot of discussions about PERS and diagnostically we have some new tools available to us, particularly as we think uh, of whole genome sequencing. Daniel, do you want to give us a little bit of background about um, sequencing in general and then those two specific tests? What, what information do they provide for producers and veterinarians? Yeah, you, read, you, you talked about this study, right, that uh, I had the opportunity to work with Giovanni here. It was funded by National Pork Board and IPPA. Iowa Pork Producers Association, and uh, start with the motivation for this study. The study followed uh, 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 20 or, or, or so herds that we went through a herds outbreak, and, uh, and, and we had the opportunity to do whole genome right in those. And so the, the motivation for that is there is a lot of whole genome herds information uh, available out there but not a lot of information, at least to our knowledge, associating the whole genome information with clinical data, right? With stuff, th things like uh, uh, success rate to eliminate PERS virus and production impact in the, in the herd following, following the outbreak. So we did this study partnering these two things, the whole genome PERS informa information and uh, some whole herd metrics, right, Giovanni, on, on the outcomes of PERS infection in breeding herd specifically. That's correct. And when you think about PERS virus, and we have the R5 that we have been basing our decisions about disease management and PERS virus control in South herds, and that seems pretty reasonable in the way that we operate with that. But the R5 is only based on 4% of the genome, so we may be missing something that's out there. And we have these uh, uh, things about using R5 in detecting more than one strain over time in herds, but we had this perception that you have more than one strain circulating in the breeding herd. So we went through these herds that face at this outbreak, as they say, and follow day over time doing sampling and using processing fluid samples or uh, sampling scheme to see if there was more than one strain of PERS while circulating this herd. So we were able to sample in those herds and we found multiple strains circulating in one sampling point of some sampling points of more than three strains that are detected in that processing fluid sample. So it was really an approach of using the next generation sequence and looking for these more than one strain circulating. So when we look for that whole genome that was recovered from this PERS virus, we could start to better understand the characteristics of these strains. That's not, the OR5 not always tell the same history. If you look for the full genome, you start to see other things as mutation, genetic characteristic evolution over times, or recombination. So by having the ability to look at the full genome, you are able to see those things that are happening in the personalized genome, and those may facilitate and help to have uh, better decisions about this uh, personalized management and control over time. So that was defined from the study, and we, are, well, but if we detect Recombination, more than uh, parasite strains, what's the frequency of that out there? And it's very frequent to detect that. Most of the herds has more than two parasite strains circulating in the breeding herd at one same point. 11 of 20 herds have recombination detected. So recombination is a, seems to be a very frequent event that occurred there. We should not be scared by that, but we should understand how to deal with those things in, in a daily basis and take informed decisions. So we start to look at that and we compare in the terms of total loss in number of piglets 
per thousand cells that was lost due to multiple virus variations or presence of recombination events. And was the number was pretty similar, about 1,800 piglets less winded per thousand cells when you had more than three pers virus strains circulating in the breeding herd or when it was recombination events detected. And I want to uh, highlight that recombination events could be between wild type strains and vaccine strains. And vaccine strains pretty easy to detect because we have a handful of strains that are out there, very well characterized. We can look for that and find. But when we think about wild type recombination, those could be very frequent. And as we have a bunch of wild type strains circulating, we don't have a bank with all of those strains to detect every single recombination. So we may miss the wild type ones that could be very frequent in the field. So those was the high level finds of this study. Thank you, Giovanni. The producers that were infected with multiple strains in their breeding herd, was it a surprise to those producers when you shared that information with them or when they, when they made that observation that they were infected with multiple strains? Or were those breeding herds that had been infected with those strains previously and just never eliminated? So when you shared with them the multiple sequences, they said, oh, yes, that's the 2021 virus and that's the 2020 virus. You know what I'm saying? Or was it a total surprise to them that they said, wow, I did not have any idea that I was infected with multiple strains at the same time? Yeah, I think uh, at, at least to, to us, uh, it, was, it was not a surprise that there were multiple combinations, but at least to me, I got to confess that out of the 20 herds, all but two had multiple strains, some with uh, more than three strains uh, uh, being infected the herds. Right, and those metrics, like Giovanni said, were correlated with uh, production impact. So the more strains, the more uh, the, the higher the severity of the person in in impact. So I think one of the take home messages is clear: whatever you do when you manage pers, you gotta focus on trying to reduce the genetic diversity of virus in the in the herd. Yeah, that's and what Clayton brought up, well, was herds that were endemic can try to eliminate. In those situations, may not be a surprise, but some of these herds was naive classification status four of the ASV, and we detect more than two or three strains that are circulating. So that was a surprise. Well, how can that be possible if you are going through an outbreak of, and in your mind, we think it was only one strain? Well, maybe when we go through a personalized outbreak and we have those strains in the field that circulate, we're not just introducing one strain in the breeding herd, but more than one strain. Or they evolve so fast that we have more than one strain. So the surprise about these herds on the status world was something that caught our attention because more than one strain on that one, we should not expect uh, on our rational on a daily basis, but was there and was a big surprise to have those occurring. So if this we uh, get our heads around and thank for all of the collaboration that was out there. And we think there is some recommendation that we can use on a daily basis for pulse next generation sequence and RR5 usage. If you went through a pulse outbreak and are using RR5, that may be helpful to understand if there is something changed there. But we highly recommend to have a, a full genome recovery at the time of the outbreak for each breeding herd. So if something changed later on, as an example, you have drop of CT values during the elimination process or clinical signs as abortions or increased pre mortality, that could be a sign that a new personal strain is out there. And you can do uh, gain next generation sequencing on processing fluids collected from that herd to compare your original strains and see if there is some evolution or mutations or combination occurring there that could highlight that the virus changed and then you need to uh, take new decisions. And when you think about the sampling type that you use, individual sampling, a serum sample, lung sample are very useful to collect a uh, full genome and recover those, especially if you have low CT values. On the other side, if you have population samples, as plus fluid samples, those are very useful to understand if you have more than one strain circulating in the breeding herd. And to do that, you go back again, you need that reference strain from the farm-specific strain to do the comparison. If you don't have that, you are going to think that the results from process fluids are useless, but it's the other way around. You need to have something to compare that to be useful to your understanding what's going on in the herd. Very good, Giovanni. I think you make a, an excellent case for why producers that have a, a wild type PERS infection in a breeding herd should um, have a whole genome sequence for reference. 
Uh, I can tell you as a practicing veterinarian, there are certainly times where you get uh, a rebreak or, or some sort of new clinical signs in the middle of the PERS elimination and you want to sequence and you want to see is the virus the same or is it not the same. And if you don't have that whole genome sequence for reference, you can maybe look at OR5, but as you mentioned before, it's such a small portion of the genome. I don't know that that gives you enough decisions or enough information to make a good decision on, you know, do we have a new introduction? Do we have a mutation of the original virus? Virus, or do we have some sort of recombination event between multiple viruses that are present on the farm? I want to thank uh, Dr. Daniel Linares and Dr. Giovanni Trevisan for coming on the show uh, and sharing their information about PERS uh, diagnostics and then specific whole genome sequencing uh, and the value relative to OR5 sequencing alone. Uh, to everyone else, thank you for listening to the Swine Health Black Belt podcast please visit us at swinehealthblackbelt.com. And don't forget to subscribe to our podcast so that you won't miss out on the next episode. Thanks for joining us and, see, and have a great week. We'll see you next week. Hey everyone, we're always searching for the latest and greatest research to share each week. If you have a swine health related research trial and would like to come on the show to talk about it with me and share it with our audience, feel free to send an email to healthblackbelt at swineit.com. And we would love to take a look at your research. Thank <laughs> you.